Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast. Um, today I'm uh, talking to uh, Murray, uh, Mark, Mark, and Lindsay, and we are going to discuss traitors, punishment, discipline, and fun stuff like that. Um, it's an in-between episode, so if you have any questions, we actually didn't get that many from uh, from the patrons, which surprised us, but I'm sure we can talk about it anyway. But we'll start with the one we did get from Stephanie, who asks, it may sound like a bit of a dark question, but when the sources say that someone was tortured, for example, for information, do we know what sort of torture tactics were employed? Um, so let's let's conjure up the the ancient version of the medieval dungeon. Murray, can, can you... Um... Well, short answer is we don't get a lot of detail. We get that they were tortured um, and that they were, you know, um, or, or, or more sort of uh, euphemistic phrases, uh, but we don't get much detail other than that. We do get insights, like there, there was the um, when Catiline was on his rise to infamy, he uh, pursued Marius Gratidianus through the streets of Rome. So he's scourging him um, with with uh, vine rods, um, which implies that it's centurions who are doing the bashing. Then he gouges his eyes out. Uh, then he breaks his limbs and then finally sort of cuts him apart. A, you're not going to get a lot of answers out of that. Um, so it seems to be more. I don't think the idea was to get in punishment there. But yeah. well, I imagine I imagine that there's similar similar things going on. Um, like Alexander the Great uses his Cretan mercenaries, for instance, to to trick a Persian traitor into betraying his betrayal. Um, so you you wonder in the the sources there's not a lot of detail but you wonder at the how did they get him to admit that he'd been doing it you know there's stories of garroting there's stories of of well there's bizarre assassination plots where they're trying to smash people with boulders and all sorts of things like that um there's the story you know of the putting your hand into a, over hot fires and swearing something's true um that's cato um which is a kind of interesting reversal of by undergoing that pain yourself voluntarily to show that you're telling the truth does that give us a re does that reveal one of the techniques they may have used to make you tell the truth uh earlier um, and, and on that subject let's not forget that it was institutionalized at the point that a slave's testimony in a court case was only admissible if it, he'd been tortured first Mm, so there, there was the yeah, idea that somehow point. or other, by inflicting pain, you will get the truth from a man mm. or woman. Uh, and I think yeah. it's one of the things that Pliny the Younger writes in one of his letters about one of the appalling treatments that one of his uh, uh, compatriots um, treats his slave household. And, and the point is that you'll, you'll get so much more out of people if you treat them respect, responsibly. And then going on from that, in the military context, the Romans actually had the frumentarii, which was from what we gather a sort of, I don't know, a group of people whose missions were rather special. Uh, they, they combined the issue of uh, doing research on people and, and also torturing. And, and again, your point being mm. is good. We don't know what that torturing would involve, but yeah. presumably hot yeah. irons is one of them. Yeah, and I mean, you know, going back to the ancient Spartans, the idea that you've got the uh, cryptiaia or even the idea that every year the helots, there's a declaration of war against them, is, of course, some form of psychological torture. You know, you've got a, an entire class of people who are, you know, made war against uh, and can be, you know, murdered and all of this sort of stuff willy-nilly without any repercussion. And there's been a lot of modern studies saying, well, it really didn't actually happen, you know, in the helot revolt that supposedly the entire Spartan system is built around which really doesn't happen at all. Like there's one that might have happened pre-marathon. There might as one might have happened in the 460s, but there's not that many Halot revolts which are, you know, known about. Um, but then you've got the swing back again the other way, going, yes, but this is not the way to talk about people. You know, that that's obviously going to keep them in their place by by psychological torture. Um, well, and even, you know, even, even the treatment of... of uh, 
not just slaves and things like that, but even the treatment of women in, in various societies like Athens, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the cloistering of, of women inside the house and not giving them any freedoms at all. You could argue those are sorts of forms of, uh, not torture, but uh, certainly certainly keeping oppression going, which I mean, I think it also it means that, that torture is common in this entire world. So the idea that torturing is abhorrent and, and out of the norm is actually, you know, it was just sort of quite a common thing to have happen. And you should also note, uh, in, in back to pull it back to our context a little bit, that um, Roman citizens couldn't couldn't just straight up be um, be submitted to corporal punishment. Um, at least they could protest it. Um, mm. I think that's perhaps isn't that why Saint Paul is supposed to have mm. yeah said that he was a Roman. Um, but as soon as somebody uh, joined the army, uh, that um, that limitation was removed. So uh, you know you could get into much worse trouble by just being a soldier because the discipline was harsher, and it would be it could and would be enforced up to and including you know the famous decimation. But it seems to be able to be uh, challenged at times. You've got a letter from uh, the Vindolanda tablets in which there's a, a protest against ill treatment by a soldier, uh, possibly to uh, thought maybe to be uh, planned to give to the emperor uh, upon his visit in terms of saying I've been uh, beaten and I actually shouldn't have, so I'd like to protest it. So whether, whether it's a you know, clear cut thing of there are actually strict rules as to this will lead to a punishment, or beating or it will not um it doesn't seem to be you know fully but that's up. the but that's the letter isn't it i think where the man describes i am a man from abroad or a man from overseas and i think the context he, he, yeah, is he's a civilian or a merchant perhaps yeah but he's, he's uh i think he may be an ally as such but he's actually claiming that you know we have been given such and such rights so how that stacks up in terms of the military context of whether he's you know what what rights have they been given have they been uh, you know recognized as such or is he being you know just trying to I don't know, um, take advantage of the situation mm. where it isn't you know nobody's actually stipulated no. yeah well I think I think the, the the discipline of the legions is such an interesting one because most of the time especially uh, when you're looking at the Eastern legions, they seem to spend most of their time being redisciplined. You know, that the idea <laughs> of the, the, the Eastern legions becoming lax and undisciplined is everywhere in, you know, every source. Uh, and possibly a trope. It's interesting, oh, yeah. Possibly a trope. Um, and the fact that the redisciplining of legions seems to be forced marching uh, and building camps, that, you know, that they, they do the, the things that we traditionally don't, consider discipline we consider them everyday life in the roman legion the idea that you march every day and build a camp at the end of that march and keep doing that is is our sort of standard way of thinking of the roman legions and yet um you know in places like hadrian's walls perfect for that you know well they've built wood and then stone forts why do they need to march anywhere and build anything um and so that idea of discipline uh there are other ideas of discipline that when a unit has done something shameful or wrong they're required to build their own miniature fort outside the fort so that they're, they're you know they're isolated and vulnerable and they also presumably have to do a lot more work themselves to build that fort for their unit than they would have if they split the work up amongst the entire legion um there's there's you know all sorts of uh in slight insights but um but again the sort of um bigger picture seems to be much less clear it's uh, in terms of the being placed outside of their fortifications, that seems to be fairly common. Uh, Polybius mentions a number of issues where somebody is punished for either you know, falling asleep on duty or you know, not uh, when they're during, doing the rounds uh, during the uh, watches of the night. If somebody is found not to be at their position, then they are placed outside of the fortifications. Uh, it's but, on the one hand, they're being put at danger that they are perceived to have actually put their fellow soldiers in danger of. And of course, he then goes on to mention that in the extreme case that it 
then uh, like decimation, there is also the, the uh, possibility of a, either a stoning or a beating of the individual at the hands mm. of his fellow soldiers who basically are taking it out on him that he has put them at danger because of his ill judgment or ill yeah. discipline in actually keeping his watch or keeping his duty. So yeah, I think from, from time to one where I think it's a cohort is, mm. is put outside the fort so that they have to make their own cohort sized camp. Um, I mean, both Frontinus and Valerius Maximus have, have sections on discipline. Um, and again, it's a very interesting one, like um, Domitius Corbulo has given the, the phrase that the best tool for discipline was the pickaxe, um, the delabra, uh, which is interesting that, that, again, it's the idea of that discipline is actually about doing the, the normal things that we associate with Roman legionaries more often, you know. Um, as opposed to the beating with with rods or scourging or scourging 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 what is what scourging scourging um, and uh, that's, that's you've also answer. you've also got a net I mean it's given less press but there's also the uh, uh, what am I trying to say uh, either given extra work in terms of things like you know famous latrine duty etc. Or if you're uh, demoted um, as such from your position, yeah. so I mean I think you know a lot of our modern um, scholarship sort of focuses on the you know the more extreme you know decimation and whatnot. Um, but yes. actually, I think there there is sort of more common you know common yeah, there are some meted out as such. Yeah, the one that many of them that we just mentioned sounds sort of like familiar, like they might happen now. Uh, the one I like always like. Is where they, uh, where a soldier who's being punished somewhat moderately has to stand guard somewhere, um, just um, without his military belt, uh, perhaps carrying some kind of you know some some big stones or sods to make him look like he's some uh, like he's some civilian doing chores that a soldier wouldn't really have to do. Which you know says something about what a soldier looks like when he's not wearing armor. Namely, he's distinguished by his belt that allows him to hitch up his tunic in a cool and military way. But it's also it's a sort of a low level punishment. Um, yeah. And they also knew the dishonorable discharge, of course, for either soldiers who then lose all the privileges they might have had if they completed their service. Yeah. So it's really predicated uh, on the idea that uh, conformity is what the army, at least the Roman army. I can't speak to the Greek so much. Um, it, it is based on this idea that you, as, as Jasper said earlier, you, you leave the civilian law space and you join a martial law space where the rules are different and you'd better conform because these are the punishments if you don't. And there are coins, for example, minted by Hadrian, which actually celebrate Disciplina Augusta. And the idea is that it is elevated to something that you revere because this is the basis of, of on which the Roman army is able to perform the miracles that it does. And people who don't conform obviously put that whole thing in jeopardy and that's why we get reports of the legions in the east being very lackadaisical and indisciplined mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting it's interesting in the sense that um like when adrianople is lost it's the discipline of the legions that's blamed uh and you know when vegetius writes his uh, de, de re militari uh probably only a few years later it's all about restoring the discipline so it becomes a, a, a right trope of we lost because we were ill-disciplined not because of any tactical superiority on the part of the of the opposition or even numerical advantage you know the fact that there might have been 200,000 goths fighting only 30,000 roman legionaries is kind of like well yeah you were going to lose no no we, we <laughs> should have won through discipline um and, well they should uh, have fought themselves to death i mean that's the roman well, <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know it's, exactly. it's it's sort of automatic if you are not allowed to leave the line when in battle for you're only or otherwise put it other way another way you're only allowed to leave the battle line one is to attack the enemy um and the other is to save a comrade and that's it you can't you know you can't flee and if you're in battle and you have survived and the roman army has been defeated then clearly um, you went against the rules, so your discipline mm. was bad. It sort of, you know, sort of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where you get that idea of um, banishment. That if you if you were shown to do that, which I think is again where the phrase "with your shield or on it" comes from, 
that if you've run away from battle, uh, you're, you're going to throw away your shield first. And therefore, turning up home without your shield is a clear sign that uh, you, you ran away. Um, although, having said that, you know, Brasidas fighting at Pit, uh, not Pitna, uh, wrong battle, um, Pylos, same few letters, um, he loses his shield in combat. Uh, and there's the argument, of course, that the famous shield in the uh, in the Stoa uh, of Athens is Brasidas's shield. Nothing says that, but he lost his shield, according to Thucydides. And there's a shield from Pylos that's dedicated at the the, the Stoa. Maybe it's his shield. Um, Zero sum reasoning. It makes perfect sense. There are well, like, absolutely, absolutely. But but that idea. Well, it's that, on the internet. It must it, be true. Well, exactly right. But you've got the idea that hang on, if losing your shield is such a big deal in spartan uh society and here you have someone who's not losing their shield through running away but basically through being in the thick of the fighting it can't be that cut and dry um and and i think the the interesting thing there of course is that if you're proven to have run away or done like that you're you're excluded from society in in, in the spartan case you know you're you're banished so you're no longer part of their their system uh, which we is get very the same similar thing to with the romans as well you can get the, yeah. the cord iron forks where you've got after they've actually had to submit and go under the yoke and whatnot and going back to um to rome after that um they're shamed by their community when they return back and mm. then you have again you've got the, the survivors of Cannae as well yeah i think they're sort of given mm. the same treatment basically and you know they end up having to sort of prove themselves in battle uh before they can assume uh you know a, a form of citizenship again and even then it's not quite the same same form of citizenship that they're actually accepted back into at that stage so there's on the one hand you have got mm. military standards imposing themselves in that institutionalized sort of aspect but at the same time there's a, there's the expectations of the community that need to be met well i think that's the thing and i think you know exclusion is probably the major form of punishment whether it be exclusion for you know not wearing your military belt or exclusion for a night or for however long but that's you know again in modern mm. terms it's much less media savvy it's like wow oh no come on decimation so much more interesting let's write about that <laughs> well um, i think in, in, in the roman context i think it, it's tied up with this idea of infamia so yeah. for example in in the case of let's say the teutoburg battle uh, obviously a disaster but there were survivors and i think you've covered this point in previous podcasts uh, uh murray where uh, there were survivors and some of them actually were, were were found and they were allowed back but augustus rules you're not allowed to live in italy the infamia of what mm. you have done is so mm. great and oh by the way the bad luck that that goes with that uh denies you the right to come home and be with us in, in, in a way those those entire legions are punished because yeah, uh, yeah. they're not refounded they're just yeah. they don't exist anymore they've all they cover themselves themselves in shame and that's it no more yeah and it's it happened that's, that's not the only case i mean there's there's quite a few legions that disappear for whatever reason uh and that are never yeah. reconstituted well the one i like by the way um so uh in the period where the romans are trying to subdue the cantabri and the asteroids in in northern spain and it's we're talking about i think 29 27 25 bc um one of the things that happens is that there is a first augusta legion and they are stripped, their, their name, their cognomen, Augusta, is stripped from the Legion right, because they yeah. perform so badly. Uh, we don't know whether that, you know, which Legion that is, does that go on to become the Germanica or something? We don't know. That's not in the information. But it's interesting, no, isn't it, that no. they disgrace the mm -hmm. entire unit. They don't disband it, but they've lost the thing that whatever their point of honor was. A century later, that isn't it? Is mm. it the same mm. Legion? Well, it that's what we don't know. It mm -hmm. probably disappears in, in AD 69. And is never. It's a, there, there is a it's first a, legion which which uh, performed very poorly during the Batavian revolt, and it might have been first Germanica, but it's it's not entirely certain which first legion it was because the the, the cognomen was never mentioned by Tacitus. Yeah, and that's so it's interesting. That there's a good story in there. We don't get to find out what it is. Yeah, it's interesting though that the you know, the recovery of the the recovery of the standards, for instance. Um, is all about recovering the standard, but the the men of the legion who were in Farmia after that action don't get recovered. You know, they don't get to recover. Somebody their, else their had reputation. to do it, presumably. Mm, 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 well, mm. Uh, Germanicus goes across the Rhine in fifteen sixteen, 
uh, and actually takes people who were serving with those units back to find them. So th this is one of the scenes that, that Tacitus describes, and it's very interesting because you can imagine mm -hmm. for those men, mm -hmm. it's it's a point for them to reclaim some of their lost honor uh, by being able to take the, the, the Germanicus to the spot. And of course, they famously find the forest with the bones and they ceremoniously bury them. Um, of course, actually in doing that, Germanicus c commits another sacred uh, mm. uh, uh, foible, uh, uh, faux pas rather. So it's it, it's very interesting. The psychology of the, the ancient uh, mindset is different than ours. Mm. Mm. Mind you, I was reading I was reading other cases of, of battlefields covered in bones because Appian records that the uh, Battle of Cynoscephalae was still covered in bones six years later. And then later in Roman history, you have the idea that, um, again, Adrianople was covered in bones two or three years after the battle itself. So there must have been piles of bones all around the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, where, 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 where battles had been fought. And Famously in Arousio, 100 and whatever that was, 5 BC, mm -hmm. uh, was yeah, a great five, yeah. disaster. And they, they said you could actually, uh, you could build fences with bones and you could grind them up, make great uh, organic phosphate and things. So. See, see, people people put, people put you know, bone fences into the ideas of fantasy, <laughs> but no, no. Well, it's interesting. So I've been re re researching the Bakofa War and even in the Mishnaic and the, the Talmudic traditions, uh, the way that you, you you shock the reader is actually you describe exactly those scenes, you know, the, the phylacteries everywhere and, and the bones and the blood drain, draining down into the rivers and so on. But bones are very shocking because it's clearly dead. It's a dead person. Mm. Yeah. And yet there's the, it, the remain strange, um, you know, contrast. We talked about, you know, the discipline, uh, how you're supposed to fight, but at the same time, you're supposed to show your bravery by not staying in your unit. You know, it's, it's always this Roman contrast that we've talked about this many times before, I think, between showing your virtus, which you have to do individually on, uh, on the one hand, and, you know, staying with your unit and conforming to discipline. And it seems to almost mm. be the case for, uh, you know, on, on the higher level too, if if you if your unit performs badly it's terrible if your unit betrays the emperor it's terrible if your unit just switches allegiance during a civil war you just take a new oath and as long as the next guy wins you're fine mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. discipline on the individual level that that's that was always very problematic to at least at least uh, i think spot beforehand because on the one hand the individual soldier was supposed to stick up for his comrades uh defend the honor of, uh, for example of the rome and the roman army uh but we have that famous example of the battle of the viserys in 340 bc where one of the consuls is uh titus manlius torquatus and they're fighting the latin allies or former allies that are now uh, fighting the romans and because of the similarity in language uh, the order has gone out that everybody's got to stay in line so that the the, the two sides don't mix because the Latin, uh, since everyone speaks Latin, there'd be no way to tell anybody apart. But what happens is, is that the son of Titus Manlius Torquatus uh, hears the insults coming from a Latin uh, soldier on the other side. That he goes out from his line, fights a duel, kills the Latin champion, and uh, thinks he's done such a great thing. But because he's disobeyed his own father's you know, strict order, uh, Torquatus has him uh, put up against a tree and has his lictors chop off his head, and that's discipline. So that's given mm -hmm. as an example of harsh Roman in, you know, discipline, inflexible, but uh, it's, it's, go it's, it's going to be done no matter what. But yeah, I think but that comes out as surprising to the Romans, not necessarily because it's harsh, but because of the, the nature of it. Because in terms of the, the beheading of him, I mean, if you look at a lot of Roman punishments, they tend not to be, I mean, conversely to our understanding of the Romans, most of their punishments tend to be bloodless. You end up getting a lot of grottings. You get um, people being thrown down the stairs from the Capitoline Hill for, you know, different things. Um, you get people chucked off the Tarpeian Rock and whatnot. But it's not necessarily, you know, cutting them up and whatnot. I mean, uh, crucifixion, of, of course, and another great great example they're not tending to be you know the, the bloodthirsty options that you might expect and i think it's for the romans that idea of uh, manlius Torquatus actually beheading his son um i think that's the the shocking thing for them there mm. and i was going to say you can actually also find opposite examples i just read this afternoon an example where um 
there was a soldier in uh, the army of Marius um, who was uh, an officer made sexual advances to him and he got mad and um, killed the officer, which you'd think, okay, that's, you know, a horrible um, crime against discipline. But Marius says, no, that's all right, because you were defending your virtus, which is, you know, there's those two values contrasting again. Um, yeah, and it's, it's interesting in the battles where, you know, uh, so I was looking recently at Pydna and at Karnaskephali. So at Karnaskephali, the Macedonian left, uh, sorry, the Macedonian right is victorious against the Roman left, and the, Macedon uh, the Macedonian left is beaten by the Roman right. And at that point, a nameless tribune, and you're like, oh, why is he nameless? Detaches 20 maniples from the victorious Roman right and wheels them to attack the rear and the flank of the victorious Macedonian right and wins the battle. Um, and then at Pydna, when the Macedonian phalanx is on broken ground, a nameless, trip, a nameless centurion goes, hang on a minute, let's get into that gap and, you know, we'll cut these guys down. So you're like, on both those battles, you've got uh, individual uh, initiative shown, which wins the battle. And yet in both cases, the individual who showed that initiative is in fact nameless in the sources. Um, so there's the kind of double-edged sword of, well, okay, we'll allow it because you won, but you actually did break discipline by doing this thing that's not. So you're saying not it's on purpose that they're, that they're not, not mentioned? I think so. I think that, because there's also, a, generally speaking, there's an alternate tradition that they were ordered, which kind of excuses this initiative and breaking the battle line. Um, but I think that you know, if it was a if it was a celebrated anecdote, surely they would their name would have been recorded, mm. uh, and there are you know there are obviously named individuals who are recorded occasionally. But again, there's a bizarre um, you know the, that's the usually individual of, bravery, right? I mean, mm. it's, it's, but it's one guy, and he turns you know it, he goes out and slaughters half the army, comes back with a shield that's mostly just the bits around the umbo, and wounds all <laughs> over, and you know and that's yeah, yeah. individual bravery but it's it's a different kind than when they when they risk other people initiative. like well, well the the amazing escalation to the siege of halicarnassus where there's two drunken phalangites in alexander's yeah, army yeah. who are basically doing i caught a bigger fish um and essentially they they spur one another on to go and take the city by themselves um and then that escalates when more and more troops join in um and you know, again, they're in stories there, but they're not named. There's no name attached to those two phalangites, which is... I, I just wonder, though, uh, just the way that ancient history is written, uh, that there are so many examples where, where heroism and those sorts of things are, are left up because the point of telling the story is is a different guy. It's it's the, it's the commander or it's the general, whatever mm. it is. Um, I, the irony is that, that we know from, for example, uh, Livy, the famous periochi, there's, uh, there's one entry about these two... Uh, people, I think one is called Chumstinctus, and I think the other one's called Actus. And these are two nervi I who apparently who did heroic acts sometime around about 15, 14 BC. So, ironically, we know the name, but we don't know what they did. But they were obviously right. they, they obviously just, did something to, spectacular yeah. that Livy bothered to record it. I clarify yeah. that the periochi are just um, sort of a what is it, contents? Uh, they're of they're the tags, book? they're notes that go on the Summary, side of the book. Yeah. They're just yeah. sort of, well, yeah, the, the books are missing, but we have sort of a rough idea what was in them. Yeah, so it's extraordinary that, yeah. that, that it was that impressive, whatever the heck they did, that it made it to the spine of the book. <laughs> but, yeah, but what yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, you've also got uh, Caesar's, I mean, just to go against what Murray said just then, um, you've got the great example from Caesar's commentaries, the Gallic War, of uh, Titus Pullo and Lucius Varinus um, mm. going, at, going out in front of the... Uh, front to you know one doing you know going all macho and deciding that he's going to ha have this enemy and of course getting himself into trouble the other having to go to his rescue and whatnot but then they don't actually re necessarily retreat back to their line again they once said you know both of them are again standing they, they go at it together and in mm -hmm. competition with each other and then of course caesar is seemingly sort of his hand is forced in terms of these guys have shown such, you know, work the, the rest of the uh, army up into such a, uh, a state that victory is attained. So 
So therefore, he's sort of mm. forced to actually praise these guys rather than punish them. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, but I think I think that's uh, a different uh, scheme. Caesar scheme. also tends to single uh, centurions certainly out. Um, yeah, maybe more than other Schiever, Schiever, yeah. Schiever as well. You know, standing there ripping out his own eye and having 120 holes in his shield. Um, but I, it's interesting. I think it might be just one of those points of difference in Caesar as a historian, because in a lot of other cases, those individuals aren't named, um, mm. whereas Caesar does name them. Well, um, because he's a commander. A, you know, he's a commander, and I think that the good commander does recognize service. So let's not forget that the plethora of Roman distinctions and 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 phalari and uh, hasti and all these sorts of things recognized actually surprisingly things like single combat, the famously spolia opima. Yeah. Uh, where, where the, with the mm. ultimate honor, effectively, if you go and actually engage in combat, I think Claudius Marcellus does this, and there's other examples where it's where it's offered but not to say accepted. Um, so there is a recognition. This is a tremendously brave, thrilling thing to do, and individual acts could be recognized by these other uh, honors. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's also the context. If you if you accept single combat, you aren't endangering anyone else. Whereas if you, like um, Mark's example, they've presumably. Uh, compromise the discipline of the unit by going forward of the line in a you know in in battle um, whereas before battle or in a lull accepting a challenge um, is is a different different context and it's where you can praise it versus condemn it and I think that's that's one of the big interesting things about the, the various um, crowns that you can get at at Rome is uh, if you're first on the wall through your own harshness, you're not going to be praised. Whereas if you're first on the wall because you are, <clears throat> excuse me, ordered there, then that's a different thing. Uh, you know that 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 whole idea of of the crowns is is such an interesting. I mean, we still have it today. You know, one of the major criteria for the Victoria Cross is if you did it selflessly. Um, there's a there's a Victoria Cross that got rejected because the the person who was up for the award saved their own life. So it was actually not brave, it was self-preservation. You're like, yeah, but they, they saved the lives of their entire crew as well. Mm, that's a very good one, maybe, mm, I'm not sure. You know, whereas the in the Roman sense, the, if you endanger the unit, you're in breach of discipline. But if you, if you endanger yourself uh, or, or perform brave deeds outside of the context of, of the unit and battle, then that can be praised. Like Skeever is defending a doorway and getting hammered for, for a long time. And so therefore it doesn't, that's praiseworthy. Um, whereas the, the, the Varinus and Pullo example is interesting. I think because it escalates into battle and victory, if, if there'd been a loss, sure enough, they'd either not be named or they'd be blamed. Um, and it's, it's again, interesting that the, you know the the famous story of the the tenth legion throwing the eagle and saying right go and get it again at Pydna the Pelad Pelasgian commander tries that and it fails. You know they throw throws the throws the throws the Oops. the, the, the sim symbol into the into the Macedonian phalanx says go and get it and they don't. You're like oh yeah, oops we don't, we don't talk about <laughs> oops that. yeah. yeah. And on that, by the way, I've just heard. What about uh, traitors? Is, is, what about tra um, I was going to oh, say, just about uh, in the Battle of Teutoburg, I think that it's preserved in, uh, is it a poem somewhere? How one of the legionaries or the, the signifer actually, or the aquilifer, literally puts the uh, the eagle standard, it takes it off and puts it in his cloak or tunic and kind of tries to, to hide it away, but uh, but it's, it's snatched out of his hands by the Germans. Hmm. So it was heroic because he was actually sacrificing his life I in order to preserve. Stories is that too, isn't that? Isn't, mm -hmm. that, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, it's very, very, like, um, very uh, right. Afghan war. The British, who was the famous? Oh, uh, wrapping the clo clo the flag around them. Yeah, and, the you know, um, fighting off the officer of the forty fourth um, foot, I think. Flashman. Uh, yes, yes. Sorry to those of you who. who... <laughs> That's the version, but. Uh, no, he's he's a very famous, and I can't remember his name. I think he's a sergeant major. Um, there's several. But, um, there's I think, uh, I think that's similar the to, at the um, Islam Lulana, I think two cavalry officers tried to yes, escape yes. with the flag. A whole different story. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, let's go to some traders. Who's got some traders on offer? Uh, <laughs> one remarkable story uh, dating from the uh, uh, War of Rome with uh, the Salud Sud Empire in uh, 191, 90, 190 BC. Uh, it's it involves the Rhodian exile named Polixenitis, who was the admiral of the Seleucid fleet. Uh, so he was a uh, very high level officer for Antiochus the Great, uh, who was the uh, king of the Seleucid Empire. Uh, the Seleucids and the Romans were at this time engaged in a struggle for mainland Greece. The front line, as it were, had shifted to the Aegean. So you have the Seleucid Navy, which was a very large and powerful navy. Uh, based at Ephesus, uh, you, you had the Romans uh, with their Rhodian allies uh, had already defeated a, a Seleucid fleet at the Battle of Caracas in 191 BC. And Polixenitis, he's so as I said before, he's a Rhodian exile, and he hears that uh, Pausistratus, who is the admiral of the Rhodian contingent of the Roman allied fleet has been saying some insulting things about him. Uh, so this comes from Livy, uh, book 37, uh, chapter 10. Uh, what exactly Pausistratus had been saying about Polixenitis is not explained, but it was insulting enough that Polixenitis had hatched a plot to bring down Pausistratus. What he does is this. He makes it known through a messenger that uh, whom he sends to Pausistratus, that he will, is willing to betray uh, the greater part or all of the Seleucid fleet, which is based at Ephesus. In exchange, all he wants is reinstatement at Rhodes. Now, what he did to get himself exiled is not mentioned uh, either by Livy, but presumably uh, it was not, uh, uh, it, was, it was bad enough to get him exiled. So, uh, Pausistratus initially feels that this, he doesn't believe it, but he sends his own man, his own uh, intermediary to meet with Polixenitis and has Polixenitis write in his own hand in front of him a letter saying that he will do all of these things. And of course, what Pausistratus now believes is that since he's got this letter in Polixenitis's handwriting, that Polixenitis must be serious or else he would never have created this completely incriminating document. What Polixenitis is actually plotting to do is so what Polixenitis promises to do is he says he's going to take a lot of the fleet out of the water. He's going to you know, uh, send his men away. He's not going to fully staff it. He's essentially going to keep it at only partial readiness uh, if, during the uh, winter months uh, so it will not be ready to fight the Romans next year. But what happens is, is that he's actually plotting all along to uh, uh, to uh, bring down Pausistratus. So Polixenitis arranges a meeting with Pausistratus. There, they, they, he goes from Ephesus to meet Pausistratus, who goes with uh, his uh, fleet of about thirty some odd ships uh, to Panhormus, which is on the island of Samos. Polixenitis bottles up the. Rhodian uh, fleet inside Panhormus Harbor, and also has sent a group of pirates to attack from the landward side. Pausistratus sees that he's been betrayed and at the very end thinks that the only way that he can get out is by trying to break out through the harbor mouth. Uh, he, how His ship, however, is rammed by three Rhodian ships. He dies under a hail of uh, javelins and arrows. Uh, only a handful of uh, Rhodian ships emerge, uh, seven ships, because they had fire pots and in uh, front of them and uh, no one wanted to ram them. But uh, effectively the entire Rhodian squadron, apart from those seven ships, was annihilated by Polixenitis in, in this very cunning uh, uh, move. It would make a good film. It, think, it would uh... make for a great <laughs> film. Uh, I mean, it, it has all the in fact, if you want to read the uh, a more complete story of the uh, Roman naval war with uh, Antiochus, uh, please consult uh, uh, Ancient Warfare issue 8 4, in which there's wow. an article by one Mark DeSantis about that uh, very, ah, very topic. Who's that then? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Wow. There's, there's, there's a lot of examples, of course, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. of um, similar uh, traitorisms. Um, I'm Mari, I'm sure that Aeneas Tacticus says that you have to be careful about traitors when there's sieges going on. There's a lot of, of examples well, the, where the, the assumption, cities are the conquered by, yeah. from the inside, really. 
betrayed. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's probably more in the tactic on, on keeping the thumb on your own population than there is about keeping, you know, an awareness of the, the besieger. Um, but it's interesting how many traitors are either get away with it. I mean, Alcibiades is such an interesting case in the sense that he mm. betrays more than once and he always seems to be able to sort of talk his way out of it. Um, and then other traitors who get around the, the betrayal by uh, either either their actions or by siding with the victor. Um, and then there are a couple whose betrayals, like the Altis at, at Thermopylae is probably one of the most famous, that he betrays the the existence of the goat track and then dies in infamy later. Um, and one of the unfulfilled promises of, of Herodotus. Uh, there are only three in all of Herodotus, and one of them is the fate of Delphius, which is most annoying. Uh, mm. The other two are to deal with yeah, but... the Assyrians. But, um, aren't they but... annoying too? But anyway, um, the... sorry, man. I was going to say, possibly that sort of gives away that... Uh, that what Herodotus is doing when he tells the story of uh, Ephialtes is that he's actually he's, he's putting all of the onus of that action upon one man and if you think about it I think what's been sort of argued in some cases is that Ephialtes is probably uh, representing a, a faction from Trachis the city just to the, uh, to the was that west of um, Thermopylae, which basically had, if you like, like many Greek cities, two different factions uh, who wanted to favour different sides in a particular war, this being the Persians versus the Greeks. P half of the population were wanting to Medize, half the population were wanting to side with the Greeks. And of course, perhaps Ephialtes is more representing a faction that got in touch with, uh, with the Persians and said, we're, yeah. we're offering, and I mean, Trachis is also in a position that's crucial to that, you know, before you actually get to the pass to actually go over the mountains and around the position, you still, you've already got to get past Trachis, which well, that, if that was supposed to be a crucial yeah. point well, in that battle, the, and it's never mentioned, but yet we get the story. No, of and that, that, is, that is where the, and the Persians are camped there, so clearly there must be some mm. accommodating locals. And I think that's the other interesting thing, uh, getting broader, Thebes, poor old Thebes, gets blamed for the betrayal of Greece. Um, and, you know, one historian has pointed out that 95% of Greek communities meet us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But 94.9% of them get away with it because Thebes takes all the blame. It's Thebes who fights for the, you know, the Thessalians, the Macedonians, they kind of get ignored, you know, even to the point that Alexander I is a, is a Philhellene. No, no, you're yeah. a medizer, but somehow you get away with it. Whereas poor old Thebes, you know, more than 100 years later, is being blamed for the betrayal of Greece that happened in 480 BC. Um, mm. And, you know, when, when they're fighting on the, the Persian side at Plataea, they get absolutely decimated, um, which is, again, uh, an interesting twist of we'll ignore what actually happened and we'll blame those guys or that guy or that community only. Um, and I, that's the other thing that's interesting from the Thermopylae example is that we've got, on the other hand, some Spartans who live through the battle, who don't die at Sparta, mm -hmm. and they're shunned by Spartan society for betrayal and, and you know, ill discipline. And you're like, whoa, hang on, that's hardly their fault. But that's a very modern take on it. That, you know, they, well, trying one to of them was actually them. given an order to actually go and uh, yeah, carry exactly. a message. And of course, when yeah. he comes back, the battle's ha over, he has to go home and they he gets home and they question him. And he ends up committing suicide, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I yeah. have a, a, yeah. an example. So it's, it's kind of... I, I have an example from the, again, the Bar Kokhba War, uh, which is interesting because it, it, what's interesting is always is, t is taking the ancient sources and also these rabbinic sources and some of these things become legendary. So Bar Kokhba has, has taken on um, a, a position of being what's called the Nazi Israel. So he's actually the, the premier of uh, the new land of Israel. And uh, it all goes well for the first year, horribly wrong from that point on. And they retreat finally to a place called Betar or Bethathar, depending on your pronunciation. And um, so the Jews are in this uh, in this stronghold, which they uh, circle with a wall and the Romans, I mean, kind of sh show up and they build a circumvallation around it, put two camps around it and prepare for a siege. 
And apparently, uh, Rabbi Eleazar of Modi'in, who is supposed to be the uncle of, uh, of Bar Kokhba, suggests that they should actually negotiate with the Romans. And you would think this would be a rational thing to do. Hey, you know, let's look at our options. The response of Bar Kokhba is to kick his uncle to death. Um, so in this context, mm -hmm. the, 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 the proposal is interpreted as an act of betrayal or of traitor uh, act. Mm. Um, and in fact, that passes into legend mm. because, of course, Bar Kokhba, in doing that, causes the fall of Bethar, which is a great disgrace to Jewish history. So, so these acts actually have, have uh, re uh, right. resonance all the way through history. Well, that's like uh, Catalan's ancestor, Sergius, who, you know, fights at Cannae, gets 22 wounds in front, loses his hand, which he replaces with an iron replacement. He's only allowed to get to Praetor because his wounds, which are the example of Vietus, but they're also a pollution. So he can't be holding any higher political yeah. office. Because, he's he's well, really just overdone you it. You can't have a man... <laughs> Too manly. Sorry. Too manly. You're like... Family fairy. Oh, God. Sorry, that was an Australian joke. So that's called Uber Virtus, is it? Well, yeah, well, you, you still have to have all the bits. Well, I guess you can have maybe a, a finger missing, but you know, have to well, have that's, that. the, that's the criticism of, of. Well, I think that's one of the criticisms of C Catalan himself from Cicero is excessive Virtus, um, you know, that he wasn't answerable to anyone else. Um, well, you have to have moderation oh, in all such things. A, such a, Exactly. Well, only if you're following that philosophy. Well, following Catalan's philosophy is perhaps a bit risky. <laughs> right. But Cicero yeah. saved yes. the Republic. Let's not forget that. There you go. And, that, and on that bombshell. Uh, yes. So, so he told, well, yes, he couldn't, certainly didn't betray this, the Republic because he told us that he didn't. And therefore, we must clearly agree with him. Exactly. On that bombshell. Right. Before we forget, I've got to give a shout. Oh, I've got to give a shout out to Mr. I've got to give a shout out to my sorry. I've got to give a shout out to Mr. Briscoe if you've been listening this far. Um, hi, my daughter's teacher who recognised me from a picture. Um, hilarious. So, uh, hello to Mr. Briscoe. There you go. Fame via the Ancient Warfare podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll see you all soon again. Thanks for listening. Yes. Bye bye. Oh, the trailer.